In the Ten Commandments, we're familiar with the command that says uh, not to take the Lord's name in vain. Most people have assumed that this command prohibits us from saying God's name in right. a particular context. Right. So either like saying it as yeah. a curse word right. or using it to confirm an oath that we don't intend to keep or that we go on and break. Mm -hmm. um, that's not, I don't think that's what's going on in mm -hmm. this command. I think it, the command fits into this wider picture of what's happening at Mount Sinai, where God has brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. Mm -hmm. They've been serving Pharaoh, and now they're going to serve Yahweh instead. Mm -hmm. He's a very different kind of master, mm -hmm. and he's one who wants to create a community of people who, um, who, are, in, who are rightly related to him and to each other. Mm -hmm. And so by their very lives, they're pointed to his character. Mm -hmm. And he expresses this by calling them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Mm -hmm. And then if you fast forward from chapter 19, where he calls them a kingdom of priests, to chapter 28, where he's describing what the high priest will wear, right. we find that the high priest has a pouch on his chest with 12 gemstones on it, mm -hmm. one gemstone to represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are engraved with the names of the tribes. Mm -hmm. And the text there says, and so Aaron shall bear the names of the mm -hmm. sons of Israel on his breastpiece. And it's the same phrase that's used in this command not to bear the name of Yahweh in mm -hmm. vain. So if you have a people who've just been told you are a kingdom of priests, yep. and then you have a priest who bears names, these I think are the interpretive clues to help us read this command, yes. not to bear God's name in vain. And if you look again at Aaron, the high priest, he also has a name on his forehead. Mm -hmm. He has the divine name on a gold medallion on his forehead. It says, holy belonging to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he literally bears God's name. Right. By having God's name and the people's names on his person, he shows that he's a mediator between God and the people. Mm. So he represents the people to God and he represents God to the people. Mm. And he is like a visual model of what's true of every Israelite. Wow. Yeah. Because they are a kingdom of priests. Mm -hmm. And so although you can't see the name written on them, it's like they all have an invisible tattoo. <laughs> yeah. And in some denominations, I can't say that, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, I feel like no, in Vineyard, we're, we're it's good. probably okay. Yeah, we're good. All right, so then I can show you my tattoo oh, as well. Oh, yeah. Because I decided to make the the uh, invisible tattoo visible. Right. So my tattoo says, belonging to Yahweh. Mm. And it's a, a way of acknowledging I am not my own, mm. but I belong body and soul mm. to the God who made me. That's so cool. So when you take that idea of Exodus 19, then you say 28 gives us a context for that. Yep. Run the through line then into the New Testament. Sure. Because there's a way someone could say, oh yeah, I guess that was a thing that made sense for yes. them. Yes. But aren't we in a different kind of thing? How does that relate to Great question. what we see happening in the New Testament? Great question. My favorite New Testament passage is 1 Peter 2, yeah. verses 9 and 10, where Peter is writing a letter to a church that's a mixed group of both Jewish and Gentile followers mm -hmm. of Jesus. And they're scattered throughout what, what we now know, know as Turkey. They're scattered throughout Asia Minor. And he calls them a kingdom of priests, or a royal priesthood and a holy nation mm -hmm. and God's treasured possession. He uses the same titles that were used in Exodus 19 to refer exclusively to the covenant community. Mm -hmm. And he applies those to followers of Jesus, Jewish and Gentile, mm -hmm. which is shocking because up until this point, it's only Jews who are part of the covenant. Right. You can, you can be grafted in or you can marry in to, to the covenant in the Old Testament if you practice circumcision and keep all of the, the laws. Mm -hmm. You can be included in that community. But there hasn't been a wholesale embrace of Gentiles. And here, Gentiles who are living as Gentiles mm -hmm. are considered part of the covenant people. They have these same titles. Yeah. So I take that as a signal that we bear God's name mm -hmm. as Gentile followers mm -hmm. of Jesus, um, just, just like the Jews did mm -hmm. in the Old Testament. That's cool. Okay. So then when you take those two frames, just try to draw the through line to now. Okay. So even, even the thing we just said, we're like, yeah. oh, that's way later, still seems like a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? Like when I, when I hear you talking about this, yeah. 
I'm somebody going to a church wherever, or I pastor a church. What are the implications that you think pastors, leaders, believers have to think about and how we live in continuity Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the historic people of God in the historic church? Notice Peter, when he's writing to the early church, he's not starting something brand new. He's not being like, hey, let's do this thing. He is, his concern is to show believers in Jesus that they are part of something that goes way back. Mm -hmm. And he takes them all the way back to Sinai with these titles. Mm -hmm. And I think in a similar way, when we invite people today to come into the family of faith, we need to help them discover that they are part of something that goes way back, Mm -hmm. all the way back to the New Testament, all the way back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people talk about the church starting at Pentecost, and I want to be like, uh, okay, so the yes, yes, kind of, (laughs) but I want to go all the way Mm -hmm. back to Sinai because Mm -hmm. that's where you first have a gathered people Mm -hmm. who are said to belong to God Mm -hmm. and they're commissioned to represent Him among the world. And I I just think that's, that's a really... That's a really beautiful picture, and it's also in continuity with what's happening at Pentecost, where they're gathered together and then sent out. Yeah, and it offers hope, right? Like, it's not just up to us. We're not just making it up afresh every few decades. Uh, The pressure is not on us to come up with a great model of mm -hmm. how to do life together. (laughs) We're actually joining something that's already been in place Mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's beautiful.